All right, everyone. Go ahead and make your way back to your seat. If you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and grab them and turn with me to Daniel chapter 2. We're going to be going through the whole chapter. We're not going to read it all, but we're going to read a, sunk, a section of it and then kind of work our way through the text. It's really all one unit. And so this is what we are doing this morning. But before we do that, um, I don't know, maybe it's me getting nervous because next week I promised you that I had sing a Southern gospel song <laughs> as we talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know. Um, but... You know, I, I have Southern gospel roots, and I grew up with hymns and choruses, and um, one of my favorites, and I don't know if you know it, but I hope you do, because I think it would be a good and sweet prayer for us this morning if we could sing it together. Um, Turn your eyes to Jesus. Who knows that one? couple of you? If not, maybe you'll catch on. It's pretty simple, but um, I, I just feel like it's a, it's a sweet prayer. It's a sweet um, invitation for us this morning because as we consider the terrifying dream of Nebuchadnezzar, the invitation is to look not to the things of this earth, but look to that which is eternal, to look to the stone that is cut not from human hands. And so if you know it, sing along with me. And I apologize if I mess it up. <laughs> I, don't, I was like, where's my phone? Oh, it's doing that. But here we go. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. One more time. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Jesus, we ask that you would meet us in this moment. We pray that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation to know Jesus better and that the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and your grace. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you wouldn't mind, would you stand for the reading of God's word this morning? We're only going to read a section of this chapter, uh, verses 44 to 49. Um, this really captures the heart of the message, and so this is what we will be reading corporately together. The reason that we stand in the reading of God's Word is because we believe that Scriptures are given to equip us, to encourage us, to empower us, so that we might make much of Jesus with our lives, that these are given to us to encourage us, instruct us, even correct and rebuke us. All of these are celebrated and honored as we stand for the reading of God's word, starting in verse 44. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut 
from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel made a request of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you. Um, Catch you up. We are in a series called Planted in Exile. We're going through the book of Daniel. And over the last two weeks, we've talked about this idea that the people of God, the exiles, were sent to Babylon, were sent into exile on purpose. And as we find ourselves also in a similar situation, that we are in exile, that we are strangers and sojourners in this world. This is not our home. We are just passing through that there are some things that we can learn from Daniel because I believe Daniel and his friends are a prototype. They are an instruction, an encouragement on how we are to live in exile, how we are to live in the world. And we saw in Daniel chapter one that Daniel was able to be fruitful even in exile because he chose with the respectful resolution, he purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the things of this world. And we saw that there's a direct correlation with the amount of defilement in our lives and the amount of fruitfulness and favor that we have in the world. And that was Daniel chapter one. And so in Daniel chapter two, it starts with Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king. He is the one who has sieged Jerusalem and destroyed the temple of Solomon and has brought the people of Israel, the Jews, into exile, into Babylon. This is called the exile. It is a significant historical moment in the people of Israel. And now they find themselves weeping on the shores of Babylon under the reign and rule of the tyrant, King Nebuchadnezzar. And so it says here in verse 1, and so if you have your Bibles, we're going to just be working through and we're going to pause at a few points and just begin to unpack it. I feel this was the best way to approach such a large um, text this morning. And so here in verse 1, it says, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left them. And so the first thing I want to just um, note a little bit here is that It's significant that Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan, had a dream. Um, He had dreams. And dreams are something that, you know, some dreams are maybe we had some bad pizza or something and our mind's just all over the place. But in the scripture, dreams can also be a warning. They can be instructive. Um, There's many times and places that dreams are used by God to reveal something to his people. Um, Even in Acts chapter 2, verses 17 to 18, when the Spirit is poured out at Pentecost, um, Peter, standing up, preaching the gospel after the resurrection, he says this, quoting Joel in Acts chapter 2, verses 17 to 18. It says, In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Now, for some of those old men, it's not that kind of dream, right? It's, not you, it's, a, it's a prophetic dream. And even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Um, for me personally, um, I don't dream very much at all. I can't recall very many dreams, but I do know two dreams um, that were vivid, and I can relate a lot to Nebuchadnezzar in that they troubled my soul. They were striking in their accuracy, and yet they were symbolic, and they all proved to be true in that they were warnings for things to come as a pastor. 
Um, God had chosen in his sovereignty to warn me through that dream. And then as I talked through a few people, and these were very critical junctures in my ministry. Um, and so I do believe that God speaks. I do believe that God speaks, as he says in his word, um, through dreams and through visions. And yet sometimes what we see in dreams, Solomon says this, or the writer of Ecclesiastes says that sometimes we dream because we're thinking too much. And we're just thinking and we're thinking and we're thinking and reading a certain commentary about this particular chapter. Um, I, I appreciated what he said because he said the anxieties of daylight can become the monsters of the darkness. The anxieties of daylight can become the monsters of the darkness. The thing that we have to note here about Nebuchadnezzar is he was an insecure king which is striking because he was the most powerful man in the whole world. And yet he was insecure. And this dream makes him even more anxious. It makes him even more insecure. And so this morning, as we work through our text this morning, we're going to ask the question, why? And I believe that Nebuchadnezzar was insecure because he realized that his kingdom was shakable. He believed that his kingdom, as great as it was, wasn't ultimate. He may have one of the most amazing seven wonders of the world, hanging gardens of Babylon. He may have just sieged and sacked the temple in Jerusalem, but he's still just a man and his kingdom is still just of this world. And yet many of us find ourselves building our own kingdom, whether it's in ministry, a church, or our family, whether it's in a job or a corporation or even sports. We feel that we are building our kingdom and it's that kingdom that's going to afford us glory and honor and significance and meaning. And yet at the end of the day, as we will see in the text, God could say enough and it's gone. And so the question begins to emerge for us this morning. What are you living for? Are you living for the kingdoms of this world, for your own kingdom, or are you living for something eternal? Are you living for something that lasts forever? Your legacy, it will fade. But there is a song and there is an anthem that will last forever. And what's interesting is another commentator said, despite his power and position as king of Babylon, in his heart of hearts, listen to this image, he was like a lost child in the darkness. I thought that image was striking. Because for all of our power and all of our prestige and all of our money and all of our possessions, many people, are still a little child wandering in the darkness. Some even refer to this as the imposter syndrome. We think that we're not enough and that how do we get here? Like a little child wandering in the dark is the king of Babylon. It's interesting that insecurity often breeds hostility. And as you read a little bit down, he's so troubled and he's so distressed by this dream, he makes an impossible ask to the wise men, enchanters and astrologers of Babylon. He says, listen, I don't want you to lie to me. I know that I normally ask you to interpret dreams for me, but I am so moved and troubled by this particular dream. Here's the thing. You're not going to interpret this dream for me. You're going to tell me my dream and then interpret it. And if you don't, I will kill you and your family. In fact, more than that, I'm just going to kill all of you if nobody can do this thing for me. Insecurity often breeds hostility. 
an insecure father often is hostile to spouse and children. An insecure employer often is domineering over his employees. Insecurity often breeds hostility. And we see this in the life of King Nebuchadnezzar. Because when you are out of control or someone threatens your perceived illusion of control, you get angry and hostile and you take that insecurity out on others. This is the heart of the classical bully. They are insecure. And so in a defense mechanism, they simply attack others. And so what we begin to see about Nebuchadnezzar is he is insecure because he has put weight in something that cannot last forever. And as we'll see in a few weeks, this doesn't last. He is at the end of this chapter convinced that God is God of gods and king of kings, but then there's this picture coming in a few chapters where he's on the famous hanging gardens of Babylon and he says, look at everything that I have done. And God humbles him for a season and he is like a beast in the field. We'll get there. Augustine um, said that the human heart is restless until it finds its rest in God. Think about that with me this morning. The human heart is restless, insecure, anxious until it finds its rest in God. Why? Because everything of this world is temporary. There is creator God and everything else. Creatures, created order, created things, creator created no matter what it is no matter good it is in this life it is temporary and yet we have the invitation as we will see to make it last forever by submitting and serving something eternal the kingdom of God but the human heart is restless until it finds rest in God and so he puts this challenge and confronts the astrologers, wise men, enchanters, and magicians of Babylon, and they are freaking out. I would too. That's an impossible situation. It's an impossible ask. And look at verse 11 with me. It says, the thing that the king asks is difficult. Understatement right there. And no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. And this is a little tangent, but it's worth pointing out because I believe that it is giving us some breadcrumbs of how great our gospel is. Because what the wise men of Babylon are saying is that there is no one who can do this impossible task except a god But gods don't live in human flesh, except ours, who the Word, who was with God, who was God, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst men. And we have seen his glory, the glory that comes from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, we serve a God who loved us so much that the ultimate revelation of who he is was not left to the scripture or to dreams. God has spoken and continues to speak in various ways, it says in Hebrews chapter one, but it says in the last days, he has spoken to us according to his son, the radiance of the image and glory of God. Jesus is the final Word. He is the ultimate revelation. He is the answer to the impossible task of sin and death. I believe that some breadcrumbs here for us as we're reading through even the Old Testament, that there's something coming, there's something coming, that there's going to be what humanity needs is a God in human flesh. 
and it's coming. And the king is furious, his insecurity breeding hostility. And so he sends out an edict in verse 12. He commands that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. And so the decree goes out and the wise men, they're about to be killed. And they seek out Daniel and his companions to kill them as well, it says in verse 13. And then in verse 14, it says, then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion. I love that. Because there will come times when evil tyrants and evil government entities may lash out at you. And how you respond will tell your heart's condition. And I pray that all of us will act like Daniel. If I was Daniel in that moment, and I'm in my flesh, I'm going, I'm toast. I'm running away. I'm freaking out here. But I love that Daniel, it says, answers with prudence and discretion. The actual um, word there is that he had a taste for wisdom, a taste for discernment. He had a taste of the situation. If you ever met someone who can either drink some wine or eat some food and they can like taste all the different flavors and chocolate and oak or they can taste, oh, I think you use garlic salt here or something and they have a, a sophisticated palate so that they can taste something. Daniel had a sophisticated palate for wisdom and for the things of how to deal with man. And that's what the scripture is saying. He had a prudence he had a discretion. He had a taste for the situation. He knew what was happening. And instead of freaking out, he operated in wisdom. And that's the thing that most of us need in these days. Even as I read in Matthew chapter 24, and we're describing the things that could continually be frustrating and shaking as the end comes. When that comes, we don't know. But we know that it's on the right History is heading towards that end, right? We know that Jesus is coming. We know that things will be, continue to be shaken. And in the most time of exile, when things are troubled and things are shaking, what we need more than all is wisdom. Wisdom, a taste for how to handle situations, discernment, you could say, prudence and discretion. And look at how Daniel handles himself with the king's man. In verse 14, it says, Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree of the king so urgent? He asked the question. And many of us, when we hear troubling news or we begin to be shaking, we don't ask questions, we start assuming things. But he asks a question. You should write that one down. Ask questions. Be slow to speak, James said, and quick to listen. He asked a question. But the amazing thing about Daniel in this moment is that he had earned a reputation and he had earned respect and he had earned even an audience with the king because of his fruitfulness in exile in chapter 1. Because he refused to not be defiled by the things of this world and therefore became fruitful and flourishing in his everyday life in exile, he had earned a position and a place of respect with the king's man. And ultimately, as we'll see, with the king himself. Let me make it really clear this morning. How you live matters. Your attitude matters. The way that you talk about government matters. How you tweet and comment on social media matters. The world is watching. He earned respect from chapter one, and he also earned audience with the king from chapter one's behavior. Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. So Arioch, because here's what I'm saying. Arioch could have just said, Daniel, you're dead. Boom. But because Daniel had his respect, because Daniel had earned a reputation in the king's court, when Daniel asked the question, it didn't get ignored. He gave him the answer. 
perhaps looking to Daniel to help in the situation. Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. I mean, this is like not just a throwaway text here. Daniel just like almost walked into the king's palace and said, hey, can you give me some time here? I'm going to go pray and interpret this. Just give me some time, king. The king was furious. He had just sent out an edict to the whole land to kill everyone. And yet Daniel's lifestyle, Daniel's choices, his, his prudence and discretion had earned him respect and audience with the king. So look at what he does in verse 17. But before I go there, um, here's a phrase I want you to remember. Fruitfulness has leverage in exile. Fruitfulness has leverage in exile. 1 Peter 2, 12 says it this way. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. And remember from first week that 1 Peter is also talking about the context of exile. But it says keep your conduct. That's your everyday life behavior and choices among the Gentiles honorable so, what, so when they speak against you as evildoers, meaning when they see that they are against their cultural narrative, when they, that you worship a God different than them, they may see your what? Good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Meaning if God, by his grace, breaks into their situation and opens up their eyes and they see Christ, they will glorify God because somehow they saw your good deeds and they had enough proximity around you that they saw your life and your good deeds and they eventually heard the message and God saved them and now they're glorifying God. That's exactly what happens to King Nebuchadnezzar in some way. He's around Daniel's faithfulness and fruitfulness and flourishing. And at the end of the day, when the impossible is now possible because of the glory and grace of God, Nebuchadnezzar, at the end of this chapter, glorifies God as the God above all gods. This is our call in exile. Fruitfulness has leverage. But Daniel did face an impossible situation. And so it's very noteworthy. What does Daniel do in this situation? Let's look at the text again. Verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made his matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. What was the first thing that Daniel did in an impossible situation in exile? He asked his friends for help. He asked his companions, and he made the need known. Church, can we have a culture here at Vintage Church where we make our needs known? Daniel could have said, oh boy, I got this impossible task. Lord Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. But he doesn't do that, does he? He immediately goes to his crew. He goes to his boys and he says, hey, Hananiah, Misha, Azariah, I need help. Will you help me? Will you pray with me? Will you pray? Will you intercede? Will you seek the mercies of God with me? I am facing an impossible situation. I need my crew. I need my companions. I need my community. So therefore, the question this morning is, who is that in your life? Who are your Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? And I find it so telling that the author here, Daniel, doesn't use their Babylonian names. He uses their Hebrew names. Because even in exile, there is this pocket of light, this gospel community shining in the darkness. And that's where he goes to seek help in the face of an impossible situation. I don't know what situation you're facing, but if the culture gets darker and we find ourselves in more and more impossible situations. We need a crew. We need a Hananiah, a Mishael, and an Azariah. We need friends that are pursuing righteousness and godliness with us. We need each other. 
If culture gets darker, if things get shakier and shakier, we do not need to isolate. That is the strategy of the enemy. Go back and listen to last week's sermon. We need community. We need brotherhood and sisterhood. But he asks his friends something specific. Look at verse 18. And he told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning the mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. He asks his friends to pray, but he asks them to throw themselves at the mercies of God. He says, we have no shot if God doesn't answer. We have no hope if God doesn't answer, but our God is merciful. So throw yourself at the mercies of God. But look at what his motive was. It's not to be destroyed himself, but also the wise men of Babylon. And I just thought this was like, it shows the heart of Daniel. Why? Because in this moment, he could have been, all right, strategy here is this. If I get the answer, then the king will kill everybody else. And it will just be me. But he says, no, he has a heart for the good of the city. He has a heart for the good of people. He has the heart of an intercessor. And so he says, God, would you please give me the answer? Not so I could be some cool boy in the stage of the king, but can you please give me the answer for the salvation of many? That's the heart of Daniel. This is the heart that we see in Jeremiah 29, to be in the city for the city. If we're facing impossible situations in exile, we say, God, would you answer not for my good alone, but for the good of the city, for the salvation of many. God, would you answer? Would you please bend your ear to me and hear from heaven so that I might see your name made known in the nations? And God answers. And what is Daniel's response? Daniel's response is worship. It says in verse 20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. To whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you for you have made known to us the king's matter. You know, good songs have good theology. And in Daniel's song of praise, we see some things that are true and right, that wisdom and might and understanding belong to God. We see that he is sovereign over the kings and kingdoms of men. We see that nothing is hidden from God. We see that light dwells within him. Revelation is God's domain. Don't look to Google, look to God. Now, Google is helpful. YouTube is helpful. But if we're seeking impossible situations that are a matter of life and death, hell and heaven, run to your friends and ask them to pray and be like Daniel and pray and pray and pray. Daniel understands that he is one link in the chain of generations. It's right there when he says, to you, O God of my fathers. In other words, Daniel knows that he's not alone. That God's redemptive plan and story is working through a people. He is not isolated. It is not just him and Jesus. He is part of a people. And that God does not take lightly that God answered his prayer. I want you to think about that. How many times have we prayed and God has answered our prayer and we just kind of gave it a, thanks God. Instead of running to the corporate gathering and offering a sacrifice of praise running and saying, how can I bless God? How can I glorify God? How can I say thank you? Because worship shapes our imagination. And in exile, we must create and cultivate an imagination that sees God as he is, not as we think he is. And we do that through truth and through scripture and through community. 
It's in Romans 12, 1 that says, In view of God's mercy, we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, for this is our spiritual act of worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformation, the renewing of our mind in exile always happens in view of God's mercy. Are you one who lives under the, 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 the keen insight that God is full of mercy and you need his mercy? It's so subtle, but we quickly become entitled. We quickly become, well, why is God not doing that? Who are you, O oh man, to speak to God? He is the creator. You are the creature, the created thing. Yes, he loves you. Yes, you are made in the image of God. But there is no comparison here, as it will be made clear over and over and over in the book of Daniel. He is sovereign God. You are not. The greatest wisdom you will ever have is when you see and say and live out, I am not God. (laughs) It's not about me. That is the beginning of wisdom or what the Proverbs says the fear of the Lord, which is a right understanding, a right perspective of who God is and who I am and living and acting accordingly. That's the fear of the Lord. But again, I cannot say enough about Daniel's heart here because look at verse 24. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king and I will show the king the interpretation. Did you catch that? He's like, please save the men. Please spare them. Bring me in. That's the heart of an intercessor. That's someone who wants to go stand in the gap. That's someone who wants to advocate and plead for another. Because at the end of the day, any gift, any of God's revelation, it's not for you. It's for someone else. It is for others. And that's why Paul, in the letter to the Corinthians in chapter 14, when he's talking about prophecy, and he says, especially, um, you should earnestly desire all spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. Because why? This is what it says in verse 3 and 4 of chapter 14. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. If God reveals something to you, as he did to Daniel, it wasn't for Daniel. It was for King Nebuchadnezzar. It was for his people. It was for the redemptive thread of history to keep moving forward. We have to understand it's not about us. And so the king asks Daniel, look at that with me in verse 26, the king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? And Daniel answered the king and said, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the God has asked. But look at verse 28, but there is a God in heaven. In other words, when someone's coming to you with an impossible situation, he's not saying, can you help me? Now, we have gifts, and we have experience, and we have wisdom. But at the end of the day, what Nebuchadnezzar needed wasn't Daniel. He needed the God of Daniel. And so Daniel says, there is a God in heaven. Is that your response when you're faced with an impossible situation? Or do you just quickly look to see if you can fix it in and of yourself? And maybe that's just, maybe, that's why you're getting human results when you need divine results. The only way that you get supernatural or divine results is if you ask the God in heaven because the kingdoms of this earth, they will fail you at these types of impossible situations. But there is a God in heaven. I love Daniel's heart. He's saying, listen, King, it's not me that you need, but there is a God in heaven heaven. It's not me. It's God. His humility is in full display here. If you look again at verse 30, you see it again. But as for me, 
This mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. God gives grace to the humble. And what Daniel received here was grace. The grace of revelation. Examine your heart this morning. Is it full of arrogance and pride? Or do you see that in the face of impossible situations, you have no control? None. And you need a God in heaven. Quickly, we're going to go through this, and I'm going to say on the front end, I know that when it comes to this next particular dream, hours and hours could be spent on the different views in terms of eschatology, and I'm going to sum it up here pretty quick, and maybe at another point we can dig into some of the eschatological meaning here. But at the end of the day, what Nebuchadnezzar dreams is that God's kingdom is mightier and more lasting than the kingdoms of men. Real quick, ah, nah, we're going to push pause. I thought I was going to be able to finish the whole thing in uh, one setting, but we're going to push pause and we're going to actually carry this into next week because it's already 1125 and um, I want to honor your time and not dishonor God's word by going over it too um, lightly. And so I will summarize in this. The most impossible situation facing man wasn't the revelation of a dream. The most impossible situation facing man was our sin. It was our rebellion against God. It was that we put our confidence in things of this earth rather than the things of eternity. In Jeremiah 2, it says that the heavens should be appalled because his people have exchanged the fountain of living water for cisterns that cannot hold water. I don't know what cistern you have turned to this morning, but we've all turned to a well that we thought would be satisfying, but in the end left us still thirsty. That's the core problem of humanity, idolatry. The most impossible situation is that we actually worshiped a created thing rather than the creator who is to be praised. And what does God do? He answers us in the gospel. He answers us by becoming flesh, walking among us, dying on the cross, rising from the dead so that we can have new life and our heart's affection and our mind's attention can be recaptured and surrendered and submitted to God in worship because that's who we truly are, made to worship God alone. So the most impossible situation was met with the gospel of Jesus. And that is what we are about to celebrate here at church as we take in our hands the cup and we take in our hands the bread. And we remember the broken body of Jesus that was broken for our brokenness and the shed blood of Jesus that was shed for our own sin and iniquity that we might be cleansed, forgiven, adopted, rescued and redeemed into the family of God. The most impossible situation was sin and death and Jesus overcame it with his life and his death in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is what we celebrate. And it should woo you to the cross. It should woo your broken heart to the one who loves you, who is sovereign and king, and yet became low-born king in a manger for you. This is the gospel.
of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you.